please switch off the mic. Manish sir, please. There is so much info. So uh, as we know that uh, uh, today we are living in a digital era, in the era of digital India where most of the systems uh, are digital in nature. Okay. Uh, this system consists of some sensors, some processors and uh, memory, power supplies and there are many other blocks. Okay. So uh, naturally this signal, this sensors acquire the signal from real world and pass it uh, to the uh, to the system for further processing which is processed by some processor, CPU and other things. Okay, So this processor is basically a digital system and uh, this uh, the sensor which acquire the signal is analog. So usually two as we have seen that signal is uh, analog and processing is digital. So we require some A to D kind of conversion means we require a ADC or a DAC. So uh, the quality of a system will depend on how this, uh, how efficiently my analog signal is converted into a digital signal and vice versa. So our speaker today, Mr. Pradeep Nair is going to discuss about the various design methods, how analog signal is converted into digital, what are the challenges he face in analog, in the design of ADC. So now I would uh, like to welcome our HOD sir to say a few words then start, soon we will start our lecture. So over to Shekhar, Professor Shekhar Sharma sir. Without much formality I just introduced the department. As Pradeep Nair is passed out of the same department, I don't need any introduction for him but few things Pradeep we have added to the department after you left this uh, department. The department is now looking uh, at the antennas design, particularly the Motorob has uh, uh, gifted us with a lab and this lab is for especially antenna design up to 4G. So now we are also thinking to extend the facility up to 5G but that will of course take some time. Now we have other than that four more streams to, thought, to, to be thought over uh, which are for students to make their career. So one is the signal processing, another is machine learning, another is microwave and VLSI. So we have now four streams as electives will be offered in these four streams to the students to make their career in those particular directions. So some of the things that, uh, that you are aware already of, uh, these are some new things that have been into. Now the more impressive is also being given on the accreditation, so our director has uh, pushed us, us um, into this direction of NBA getting accredited for not only UG but now also we are in pipeline for EG process. So much effort has been done in this direction as you may be aware also that this time the NIRF ranking has also been gifted to the college between 200 to 250 position. So to all the viewers we are also trying to inform in a way that we also have BLSI design now in our uh, department and further subjects are being fought over so that uh, in that stream also the people can pave their way. So with this short introduction, I just uh, take over uh, my position. Sir, say request karunga director Sir, you can ask two words. Sir, can Thank you, Mr. Srivastava, Shekhar Sarvaji head and his electronics department team. Congratulations and best wishes for today's seminar and best wishes to participants also those who are joining in this seminar. Uh, Mr. Pradeep are you listening me? Yes sir. Yes sir. Thank you. So not, not much detail I will tell you but uh, in brief I will tell you you please do come to Indore soon and see our electrical electronics instrumentation biomedical laboratory in detail and Tell us how your Texas instrument will help us a lot because you yes. want to enhance the testing and consultancy and if you want you can give here a laboratory also specialized laboratory of Texas instrument for this region also that we'll discuss in detail okay sure. not in this time because and thank you very much for sharing your knowledge uh, for our uh, teachers for our students and faculty members thank you very much please Pleasure. share your knowledge. Now I would thank you Saxena sir. Now I would request Dr. Preeti Trivedi madam to please introduce our today's speaker to our participants. Preeti madam. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you ashwin good evening to one and all it's my immense pleasure to give introduction to our today's speaker mr pradeep nair pradeep nair completed his bachelor of engineering in electronics and communication engineering from sgs its indore in 2006 and mtech in electronic design from iisc bangalore in 2008 I remember he has been a brilliant student and one of the best student of our department. Still, we remember his simplicity and sincerity. Our department is really proud of him. Pradeep Nair joined Texas Instrument as a validation engineer in 2008. Since then, he had worked on testing, characterization, and debug of high-speed pipeline ADCs. He has also worked on AIP solutions for. optical time domain reflectometers his major areas of work has been bench hardware and char plant development customer support characterization debug and some amount of test solution development thank you yes. so so yeah so now i would like to invite pradeep nair sir for delivering his lecture sir now it's over to you yeah first of all uh, uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to have an interaction uh, with uh, with an audience who i can relate to uh, because i have been there and uh, this information that comes from uh, uh, anybody in the industry i understand uh, it adds some amount of value and uh, uh that is what i would like to do uh, through this uh, talk so uh, let me jump to the presentation right away okay so uh, today's uh, talk is about uh, mixed signal design and the testing uh, and challenges uh, involved uh, in a mixed signal uh, device so the mixed signal uh, by itself is a is an important area uh, in ic development nowadays because uh, as has been touched upon uh, earlier uh, in many systems uh, you will always find a coexisting digital and analog and uh, most of the applications today since everything has moved from a back end computing or a, a huge computer back ends to mobile phones or uh, systems which interact with the uh, with all of us very directly may may be medical portable equipments or uh, again as i said mobiles or uh, all these uh, involve analog to digital conversion or digital to analog conversion because there is an interface which is required a lot of wireless sensor networks exist in today's world and all of these demand the mixed signal uh, part to be handled by a single chip in older times it used to be the case where there was a dedicated analog uh, front end which would only handle the analog signals and then there might be a separate adc which is sitting as a interface between this and uh, a back end digital but nowadays uh, the requirement is for miniaturization everybody wants smaller and smaller form factor now when you want to put everything into a single chip then we call it a mixed signal device because uh, there is an analog front end which has been designed in on the chip and uh, there's a digital back end which is also sitting on the chip so along with this mixed signal design requirement comes the challenges because any ic which you develop there is a requirement to test it to validate it and to productize it and uh, as i go forward uh, the initial part of my presentation will be touching upon how this development happens and that will uh, uh, give an idea about uh, the number of steps which are involved right from uh, the idea to the product so the way the outline of the uh, of the presentation is uh, as i said the first a touch up on the ic development flow uh, this is also for uh, all the students or aspirants who want to join the uh, the ic industry or maybe uh, join some research work on that to understand what all steps are involved to uh, uh, to get an idea from uh, a uh, conceptualization to a product level then uh, we will talk about uh, the silicon validation and test in the ic development this is specifically the topic that i would cover more in detail and uh, using some case studies which will follow it about how some couplings can happen and what how we cover the uh, the test and validation problem 
and a few other touch ups on dft dft for some of you uh, who may not know it is designed for test which means that you put in some dedicated blocks so that you can test the device much easier so there are a few case studies uh, to cover all these things and as an add on towards the end i will just uh, in a single foil try to touch up upon uh, the skills that uh, uh, from my experience i felt are uh, needed or required to be a part of the signal development team this might be useful for those people who might uh, be facing uh, any campus interviews or off campus interviews or anything that is needed in the industry and then we can jump on to the q and a so as i mentioned uh, the ic development i'll say we all understand where it all starts from which is a wafer and finally where it ends which is a package chip there are cases where you don't have a package chip also but uh, i'll take the most generic case and uh, starting from the specifications which lead to a circuit design obviously with the circuit design comes uh, the need to understand what package it would go in uh the package is basically the the outer thing that we see usually inside it sits the uh, the wafer the silicon chip so package becomes an important consideration for some reasons like thermal and uh, board design then after having uh, uh, done the design part of it there is a there's a very important phase which is the design validation before you release the the design to the fab and the fab is the step where you actually physically go and make the uh, chip so the validation has to be done before it this is done through uh, tools which help to test the design obviously the layout happens in parallel then you have the phase uh, which is called the silicon validation now the silicon validation is the step which is uh, after the chip has been formed and it comes back uh, into lab for uh, for testing and this is where we we focus a lot of time on at least i and uh, my team uh, focuses a lot of time on and this is the part where i would be touching more upon then comes the next aspect of it which is production test and this is one aspect which i would uh, just spend um, a minute or so to emphasize the importance of product and production test because many times uh, uh, we see that a uh, lot of state of the art work happens in uh, circuits a lot of uh, uh, cutting edge works happens in uh, ideas and uh, design even eventually when the chip comes out and uh, it performs in the way that it was expected to by theory by design by circuit but then when you take 100 samples of them maybe 50 samples only pass the tests or perform consistently now when this kind of an equation exists that you have 50 parts which don't perform or have some kind of an an issue in uh, uh, performing to the level that it was the state of the art idea stops becoming a product because finally at 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 a business level uh, the production or the mass mass uh, production of anything is the thing which drives the ic design only because you can make too many ics or too many uh, parts out of a single wafer that is the only reason people put so much of money in making the so very costly equipment that are required for the ic development so the moment you are talking about 50 out of 100 parts not passing it's very likely a case of a very good idea not becoming a product and this exists not only in the ic develop ic industry but then it develops it, it is present everywhere so production test again happens to be such a critical element of the whole thing that you have to sometimes go back and revise your specifications just to make it a product so that's the interesting part about the whole thing that many times uh, uh, when we are looking at the whole problem of ic development many of us uh, in colleges and in research sometimes uh, miss out the part of the the production or the uh, uh, the yield part of it how many passing units out of the total parts so the entire chain has to be aware of each other in in this whole cycle starting from specifications the circuit design the validation in two different levels so that is why it is good to understand the whole flow and how different of different steps that i have shown here further bifurcated into further steps they happen because once you know how the whole flow is then you can find a spot where you think that your strength lies and you can maybe focus more understand more learn more on that uh, any time if anyone have a question i don't know how to uh, uh, kind of exchange it uh, money sir or somebody else may help to uh, pass on the question if there is a question on it but we can stop and maybe spend any time if required
sure to be sure we will take it in the last of the lecture right okay Right, so touching upon the details of the IC development flow, I have uh, uh, broken it into two phases. Phase one is the time which is before the design is released to the fab. Now, when the fab is the place where the, the main uh, investment goes, the main uh, physical formation of the chip is where the fab is. That is why it is very important to see all the activities which happen before it. Obviously, fab and uh, production of the silicon wafer is a big uh, area in itself. The device physics uh, deals with that, and there are a lot of uh, uh, research work which happens in that area. Obviously, it, it has a lot of impact on the overall production cost, so that's why it has a different metric. And uh, uh, the amount of research which goes in is to find out a mix of uh, superior performance and cost. But that is not uh, something I'm going to touch here. So that's why I'll discuss something which happens before and after uh, the section where the, the fab operates. So as I mentioned, there are different uh, steps which include specification, design, verifications, and all. But then if you look at a mixed signal device, you have, uh, uh, when I say mixed signal, it obviously has some sections which are purely digital. There are some sections which are purely analog. And obviously, there are things which will be between the two, analog and digital, which we call as mixed signal although the full chip is still a mixed signal chip. Now, in terms of specifications, there are different metrics that these three, uh, three uh, dimensions, these, these are three verticals, you can say. These three verticals are trying to optimize. So specification-wise, if you see the digital looks for the speed, the technology, the area, the DFT, and other things. The analog looks for the power, linearity, noise. These are the important parameters for the analog designers. And then when it comes to mixed signal, there are uh, things like digital algorithms which are employed for uh, making these two things work without errors. And this will be more clear as we go ahead because there are specific examples where you can see the digital and analog having an interaction and creating performance uh, issues. So this is a specification stage because this is the place where you're trying to set your target. Then comes the design phase where uh, the actual work happens of uh, putting the design. So whether it be a circuit design, like the transistors, port connected, and all that, whether it is the RTL coding, which is the, um, um, the digital side of it, where, where you kind of write uh, the, the code and design the digital section of your thing, yeah, different types of languages used there. Uh, then in the mixed signal, typically, because it's all about calibrations and algorithms, it uses uh, uh, MATLAB modelings or any other modeling tools for uh, modeling the analog errors and trying to find out uh, the best methods to, uh, to get these algorithms running. Then comes for the fun functional verifications. When your design is done, you need, still need to make sure that whatever you designed it for is verified. This is obvious uh, mainly, but I have still put it as a step because in industry, you still want different people to work on these because uh, uh, when you design, sometimes the aspects that you need to test might not be very, very obvious to you. There must be a much more uh, systematic uh, verification of any block that is done in terms of the specs that you have set in the start. So this functional verification happens uh, all for uh, digital, analog, and the uh, algorithms. Then uh, comes the next step, which is the verification post back annotation. Now, the back annotation is uh, just an additional step, which uh, is done after the layout is done. So just like any uh, PCB board that we, un we can easily understand and we find it on all, all uh, electronic uh, equipments, the PCB design, you will basically put something in the schematic. You will form the connections. But the final physical realization of it is in form of a layout. Uh, so just like the PCB layout, for the chip also, you will have a layout done. And when you do the layout, it will not be exactly one-on-one -on -one to the schematic because many of the parasitic elements which come in due to the layout constraints and extra routings and uh, uh, the floor placements and all, you will have additional parasitic resistances, capacitances, and inductances, which will come as a part of a layout exercise. Back annotation is basically to take care of all these things. So there are tools which will estimate the uh, parasitics uh, the parasitic resistors, parasitic capacitors, and some other effects, and then put back in your schematic uh, design on the actual design. And that is why there is a loop that I have shown here, where after we do the layout, 
there are some exercises to tune the design again to get your simulations match the spec. So this is also a, a key uh, step in making sure that the design has uh, completed full verification. After that, there is a top level verification, which is a little more on the chip level. All the functions are tested. After all these things are done, the design is released to file. Now, as we go to this phase two, the phase two is more about post-fab activities. But the post-fab activities categorize into three zones again, three verticals here. One is more about the bench characterization and the debug. The second is about the production test, which I emphasized earlier. And then there is a product qualification, which is required. Now, all these have their own impact in terms of um, the so product qualification, as you can think of, it is more about the product. It's, it's about the reliability aspects. It's about uh, some things which have to meet the industry standards in terms of uh, how many hours of aging and uh, burn in and few of the other terms, which again is a bit more uh, specialized area. And we will, I will not touch upon it much, but you can see that there is something called a product qualification. Only then it is ready to sell. Otherwise, it cannot be sold. Then comes the production test, which I already uh, told you about um, the importance. And uh, the key part here is to, to be able to test most of the features of the device without uh, rejecting many parts. So this is the place where you have to basically make a decision on how many parts are good parts and how many don't meet the spec. And uh, if, if at all, there are uh, more fallouts in terms of uh, failures mostly your product cannot go through and make it to a product. So it has to be redesigned or there has to be fixes done for uh, production uh, yield improvement. When we come to the bench care and debug, this is more of um, uh, the validation aspect where a lot of debug has to be done to ensure that anything that is found as a bug or a performance impairment. Now, because we are talking about the mixed signal kind of a device, as I will show you in the next slides, uh, there are aspects which are much more, uh, uh, much more uh, uh, wider, and they are not just a few aspects that you need to test before you can say that the device is good in terms of performance. So that's why the bench cam debug happens to be a very uh, uh, a separate area of work, and uh, the main responsibility of a bench care or a debug engineer, which I have played mostly my <laughs> role in, is to uh, find out uh, silicon impairments and uh, obviously plan for uh, different hardware and software requirements. Like you have to make a PCB board to make sure that uh, you can test your part, you can see all the metrics uh, or the performance metrics that are a part of specification. Then obviously validate it across different parameters like supply temperature. In between that, there are cases where you might find certain performance impairments. You have to go more uh, deeper and understand what aspect of the architecture can cause that issue and help to solve it even. So the design update for bug fixes is a part of uh, the cycle where uh, you will uh, give this feedback to the design and uh, get some of these issues or deep bugs fixed. So after that uh, cycle of uh, functional verification where you go back and forth sometime uh, trying to tune your setup, sometimes you have to make sure that your testing hardware is not in introducing uh, any new error. So that is uh, the aspect which is challenging here and uh, uh, this is the thing which i will uh, mention more in my following slides but after these uh, updates are done for the bug fixes uh, then comes uh, more of a process uh, uh, and the methodology where you have to make data sheets and uh, uh, evm boards the evaluation modules that you will find in different companies website to test their devices these are like something that is done by again the bench care debug uh, engineers and uh, on the production side, you have to check for the test coverage and stability and uh, yield, as I mentioned, and call approvals, and then it is ready to release. Once it is released also, it is not all uh, complete because there are still some things which are uh, for production support, post-release support, which may be due to uh, any customer returns where people find failure in the part, anything which can perform and can make their system not behave according to what they expected. And there are application nodes. This is, again, an area where uh, the engineer has to understand uh, how the chip can be used in multiple ways. And he has to, it's more, it's more like a marketing, but from a technical perspective, where the technical knowledge is more uh, important than just the features, where you have to make reference designs and try to show them that, see, this, this, can, this kind of an application is achievable using the chip. 
So this is the the whole uh, development flow, which has the design aspect, which I showed in the phase one. Uh, it has um, uh, multiple steps to uh, to catch the design issues and all. And then the second part, which is more of relevance for this talk, we have the CAR debug and uh, finally taking it to production test and uh, release. So just to get back to the mixed signal device uh, uh, architectures, I'm just putting a typical example here. It is not exhaustive still, uh, but this covers uh, many of the things which are usually present uh, in a typical uh, device. So uh, here, as you see, starting from uh, the front end. So this is an analog front end followed by an ADC. An analog front end is basically uh, there to condition the incoming signal, which can be as simple as uh, a microphone, for example where you're just talking to talking into uh, the mic like we are doing right now and then there will be something which is going to amplify vcat is a voltage controlled attenuated this is again uh, for controlling the gain of the path then there's a programmable gain amplifier is again for the the gain in the path so these first three elements are for controlling the gain of the channel then you have a low pass filter uh, which is typically a requirement for the adc conversion so those folks who are uh, familiar with the signal processing would directly understand why the LPF sits here. But generally, you can you can identify amplifiers, attenuators. You can identify the filters. And then comes the mixed signal part, which is the ADC. And all of these uh, are not static uh, or uh, fixed performance devices. They actually have a lot of options. Now, the digital block, which is sitting here, which can be much bigger functionality than what I'm showing here, it can control uh, these kind of parameters. Like you can have a gain, which can be programmable. You can have attenuation, which can be programmable. Uh, this gain can be programmable. LPF corner frequency can be programmable. The ADC parameters can be programmable, and the uh, calibrations are possible. So it has uh, multiple operational modes, which is uh, where the, uh, the the idea of uh, testing becomes a little more wider than the older times where uh, the parts were independent. Like earlier, you would have a single PCB where the LNA will sit outside. You might have some of these blocks together. The LPF might be a discrete filter. Then you might have an ADC chip, which is uh, sitting separately. So in earlier, uh, like in 10 years back, when I joined TI, uh, we used to make only ADCs, uh, which is this section. And the spec was only limited to what ADC should do. But now when, when we are reached here in 2020, uh, this diagram itself is not a full picture. We have actually even more uh, bigger devices than this, only because uh, today people want integration. People want more and more blocks uh, to be integrated, and they don't care whether it is analog, digital. They talk to each other. It is it is no concern. Finally, the products require more and more integration. So that is where uh, we come to the challenge of uh, testing these mixed signal devices. So uh, I will categorize uh, the challenge or the, the, the focus of uh, this test and validation problem into three. Uh, one part, which basically looks for coverage. So when we talk about, as I said, DFT is designed for test. And coverage, uh, just by literal sense, you can understand that it is trying to cover uh, the device function. Hello? You can think of it this way that if you have a product, let's say you buy a mobile phone, you kind of scan through all the features of it to make sure that all of the things work. It is just like that. If you have got a chip to test, the first and foremost thing is to ask how many features, what are the functions that are critical and that are part of spec. So it includes the functional modes. It can include some redundant modes, which are not part of the main functions. And it can have some specific application cases, how the chip will be used you may have to mimic it to find out whether the chip works fine for that particular case. So the coverage is the first and uh, very important topic that I will be showing you in more detail. But uh, uh, that is a problem because of the kind of uh, devices or the kind of blocks that I showed you in, my, um, in, in the typical chain. The type of devices are many. The type of uh, blocks, you could see an amplifier, you could see a filter, you could see an ADC, and I will show a few more. All these needs to be tested in different ways, which is what makes it challenging. So I'll anyway touch upon it again. The second aspect of it is, that, is the fact that you have digital and analog blocks sitting in the, in the same chip. So it is like a, a class full of students who are 
generally talking to each other. You can find out some students who would be trying to focus and read something, maybe something uh, of their own. So you can see a crosstalk, like somebody who creates a noise can, uh, can affect somebody who wants peace. And in terms of analogy, you can look at it as digital and analog problem, where digital is inherently noisy because there's a lot of switching happening continuously. And analog is, on the other hand, is uh, a very noise sensitive uh, section. So in the analog, because every value, every sample or every finer detail matters, like so you have an amplifier which is trying to uh, amplify a signal, uh, and then you get a switching uh, noise from some other side of the chip. So the digital to analog coupling becomes a serious issue in many of these uh, SOCs or the system on chips where you have digital and analog integration. So that is why this becomes a challenge for uh, the test validation of mixed signal. And you have to do a very careful board design uh, so that the board doesn't become a cause of uh, this crosstalk. And you have to do root cause debugs when you see an issue and then you have to obviously fix the design or you have to find out solutions which can be system level. So this is also one more case study I will uh, present here. And then comes the DFT for digital corrections and trends. This is an aspect maybe it's not very, very take care of uh, the specifications. We always make sure that, okay, if this particular thing is supposed to work some way and it, it works that way. And uh, multiple features of this, we kind of research nowadays more and we go and kind of make sure that all of them really happen. And uh, this is the same thing any buyer will do. So as a as, as a somebody who has to release a product, what we need to make sure is that uh, that product is in to the, it, it meets the product specifications. And uh, specifications might be as simple as uh, maybe the power or the functionality or some some kind of a feature which is uh, important. But then it's important to catch these bugs very early because whenever uh, it delays uh, and uh, you have to make a revision much later in the development cycle, the cost of that increases. And uh, post-release, once the part is in market, doing any fix is a very high costly thing because it uh, uh, it has to be re replaced for the customers. As you would have heard in, in some auto industry examples, you would have seen that some parts come uh, buggy like in the car and then they have to just replace that component free of cost. And But it hits uh, the image of the uh, company also. So both in terms of cost and the image, uh, the, any, any, any uh, organization would like to reduce uh, post bug, post uh, release bugs. And that's why we need to cover maximum. So we have to design the test so that we can cover maximum features. And uh, as, a, as, a, as one thought here, the digital only designs, now we are talking about mixed signal, but in the digital only designs, there is definitely an area which works for getting the extensive DFT, extensive design for test for maximizing coverage. And it is basically done because uh, the digital designs are uh, way, way bigger than uh, the analog only designs. They are huge. Just think about the processors that you use here. They all have to be passing through this extensive DFT tests, which make sure that there is no digital bug or a defect in the part. And this is just one example of that kind of a, a, a topology. This is not the only topology, but this is one of the topologies where, which is called a boundary scan for digital design. This is just to touch upon uh, uh, one of the topologies, but not very, very uh, uh, detailed here. So where you can see multiple blocks, uh, they have these yellow colored block boxes. These are called boundary scan flops. And these are used to put in data and take out data and, and um, compute the digital logic so that um, uh, uh, a mimic can be done of their real time. But anyway, this is something that uh, you all can read uh, uh, offline. There's a big area. This is just the starting of a digital design test. But then I'll quickly come back to the mixed signal test coverage because um, uh, the context was I wanted to show you the digital design. It's much more structured because uh, it is more about applying a certain logic, which is uh, a, a test vector, like a pattern of ones and zeros to any block. And you must know what you must get. Once you have that kind of a mapping, it's all about uh, running it on a very resourceful uh, computer. And it can still give you 
maximum coverage. But when it comes to mixed design, it has a huge spectrum of design blocks. It is not uh, as controlled and as systematic as the digital uh, design. You have things which are gain blocks, you have things which are filters, then you have mixed signal ADCs, you have clamps, and uh, you have reference uh, voltage generation, which is uh, mainly meant for generating the band gap voltages and reference currents or voltages. Then you have clocking section, and then you have the digital. Anyway, so the digital itself can get covered by the boundary scan, but you can see the spectrum of uh, blocks which, which exists. Um, and all of these needs to be covered. Covered as in, at least you must know that it is not having a defect. For example, this capacitor which was there as a part of filter, it's not broken completely. Because if it's broken, it's not manufactured correctly. You need to know it. And that is the problem of coverage. And it is that's why it's difficult to address the coverage with a single DFT strategy, unlike digital, where the digital can focus on uh, improving the coverage by applying the best type of vectors. But here you have to devise new test methods to catch any of these issues. So again, uh, uh, some way of separating it out and to make you understand. But uh, this might be the last slide with all these block diagrams. And we will jump on to more case study kind of uh, examples next. So here, I'm just trying to show you what kind of blocks exist in terms of analog, digital, and A to D, where you have analog only blocks, which are PLLs, DLLs, amplifiers. You have data path. Then you have logics. So all these need to be tested. And what they need to be tested for. Because when I say test it, it is not always just the functionality. There are a few more things. And those few more things start from the fact that you need to understand the design margins. So even if your design works, at this particular time, under this condition, you need to make sure that there is a there's a parameter called PVT, which is process, voltage, and temperature. So the design margins basically exist for those because the process, which is the the fab parameters when you when you design many many chips, that will change. That can change the behavior of the chip also. And whatever was a pass today, maybe when you make the hundred thousandth part it might have a drift in the process parameter, which can cause the design to fail. Then there is a voltage uh, variation, which is possible, temperature variation, which is possible. And all those things need to be covered by uh, a design margin test. And this, again, through an example, will be more clear. Then there are things which are meant uh, to be redundant parts in the, in the design. Redundant because uh, only when something fails, the redundant block will come into picture. And this redundancy, is also to be tested because it's also um, um, it's a critical thing because if the redundancy doesn't exist or it is it is itself failing, then um, uh, it is a design fail effectively. Then you have the A to D interface functionality and all these are something uh, it's much more obvious and I would not be covering that. So let's come to the design margin problem. Now the design margin of analog blocks is uh, is an interesting um, problem because. Sometimes when the analog blocks are designed, we have we put a lot of feedback uh, elements in that. And the, and the beauty and uh, disaster of a feedback loop is that uh, it will not fail uh, or it will not show any signs of failure until it fails. So because of the feedback nature, the feedback masks many of the drifts inside the block. For example, you have a delay locked loop here. The delay locked loop has a, has a controlled voltage control delay line. So the delay lock loop is nothing but something which will generate a copy of clock in at the clock out. And this copy of clock in and clock out also comes along with additional uh, outputs, which can be at different uh, delays. So this delay loop, lock loop can will, will usually work fine by using the feedback and uh, feeding it the, the V control or the voltage control to the delay line so that the right amount of delay exists between in and out. Although I'm showing it only one output here, but it is potentially possible that for a given clock, you can get phase shifted versions of clock here at the output. That is the main purpose of putting a, a delay lock loop. But then the, the fact of the matter that here, there is the loop which is trying to control and make sure that this is always locked, will always mask the fact that if any of these components, like the, the delay line itself is operating on a very marginal point, it will still work in your test. But then 
we need to monitor and make sure that that design of this uh, delay line it is not at the margin that means when the silicon comes if we are able to test which uh, spec which end of its operating region this uh, delay line is working then we can ensure that the enough margin exists before it is uh, sent out as a product so the critical node that needs to be monitored here is the v control now because this in, in any control theory you can understand that there is a control variable and the control variable should not be at the edge it should not be the edge of its operation so let's say if the v control for this delay line or the this this uh, uh, main actuator block was such that it was supposed to be between 0.4 volts to 1.4 volts and uh, if you can observe the v control and you find it is very close to 1.3 volts in normal process at the normal temperature and the normal voltage you know that you have a problem at hand because the moment any of these parameters drift you are about to hit your maximum value of 1.4 easily and the device will fail although it will not fail in your hand at that point so that is the criticality of observing an internal node so whenever there are uh, loops uh, designed we usually make sure that there is a critical node which is available to a test pin and this test pin typically will only be exercised during the characterization or uh, uh, validation phase to ensure that many of these chips are characterized and uh, we have a distribution of this uh, voltage and it is not at the edge so this is how uh, uh, an observability can help to measure the margin so while designing any block in fact this is a very useful thing for a designer also when you end up in as a designer in any place you have to make sure that these kind of things are available to the outside world so that your block as a, as in itself has this critical uh, output given to uh, observe the margin similarly to this there are many other observable nodes which can be put in design which are like amplifiers output common mode which can tell you how uh, properly it is biased or not then there can be block level power supplies which can be brought out on test pins and this can indicate that there is there a supply drop from the pin to the block under operation all these helps in generally uh, debugging uh, any of the issues that you might see or just to uh, make sure that the margin is good so the coverage for design margin enhances the quality of design that way this is the second point that i had mentioned the dynamic redundancy this uh, will become clear uh, when you think about a design uh, which is supposed to work beyond its range let us say that there is uh, there are two paths from input to output so this is your input just don't worry about what this is doing but think of it this way that the input that was necessary to be handled was uh, 0 to 1.5 volts but then one of the blocks can only handle between 0 to 1 so it cannot handle more than that but as a designer you can always uh, bias some parameter so that it can operate after that also but it cannot at the same time handle the full range so it's like two blocks put together to handle the full range so one block will work from 0 to 1, one volts and by doing some kind of adjustments in the same block and putting a copy of it you can make it work from 1 to 1.5 as well now when we have this kind of a scenario you have uh, uh, no problem it looks very very simple and obvious that there is a selection logic which will based on input it will select between the two but then the issues which might come up is that whatever we design for doesn't come out uh, because there are drifts the voltage drifts the process drifts so as i have shown this example whatever was looking like a good scenario having no problems uh, and the input was completely getting handled here comes an issue where one of the path has got skewed and it can only handle from 0 to 0.98 and the second one has no issue but it can only start from one volts so because of this kind of uh, issue and this can happen just because of the selection logic sometimes having a, a, an offset you might have an area which is not at all handleable and this is not easy to find out because sometimes you might apply an input here and you might apply an input here and both work but then there is a dead zone and the important thing is how to ensure that there is no dead zone and this is handled by a zone overlap so in typical designs, what they do is that in case you have this kind of an issue where a path has to switch from one to the second, you will put some kind of an overlap zone. So instead of having the path one fixed between zero and one, I would rather design it from zero to 
slightly higher than the number and the second path can slightly handle a lower one so because of that this overlap zone can be either handled by this one path or the second path the selection logic can have its own errors but then in this this much is your redundancy this is the redundant path because uh, the selection logic can choose any one of them so this is a typical design method that uh, somebody can use but then there's an issue which will come along with it so i'll take you to a real example of what this block would be so let's say you have a pll which is supposed to, uh, so a pll is a face lock loop which has uh, its own internal oscillators so uh, it will receive a reference clock from the outside and using a loop method it will it will try to lock the internal oscillator which is the voltage control oscillator it's a vco it will uh, lock the phase of this vco with respect to the reference clock but this vcos can be of the order of let's say for example uh, as uh, in one of our chips we have vcos which are 9 gigahertz vco which are 12 gigahertz vcos 6 gigahertz vcos so we have multiple options and those multiple options are required because uh, sometimes the chip has to operate in different clock rates it, the, the range of inputs that it has to take can be very wide so let's say uh, i put these three different vcos uh, for extending my range from uh, one frequency to other frequency and just like as i showed earlier there is a vco select logic which will take care of uh, which vco should be used so as i'm showing here uh, with the input frequencies i switch my vcos and there is an overlap in this just put by design now when we do this kind of a design the challenge which comes to uh, the testing part of is how do you test the redundant path what if they still get skewed what if the vco had was not centered where it is but it was further left and what if vco2 was further right how to make sure that vco1 also exists here and vco2 also exists here so you have an overlap or not needs to be tested so this kind of a coverage needs a special control to be given so what it is trying to do is that instead of the vco select logic which is auto select logic we give a control for testing where we will intentionally force the vco so let's say this frequency uh, right now which is the overlap region if i want if i can intentionally take my uh, use case to that frequency and instead of vco1 i can force vco2 then I know that the VCO2's range is there. It is, it is existing there. And uh, that way I can make sure that the overlaps or the dynamic redundancy is actually present. So this is one way of uh, giving an extra control, but this has to be given by design. So it cannot happen that I, I, I don't have this control and I can still do this kind of a test. So finally, this is an input which as a, as a characterization or a debug engineer, I have to give back to the designer. Say, why don't you put this kind of a control and uh, give me an option to make sure that none of the chips will fail for a uh, redundancy check. Now, if there happens to be, uh, let's say again in production, sometimes you might find that these, these may not exist. So these becomes a very important uh, test for the production also. So that the chip, when it goes out and gets used, has no chance of failing. So that's why these controls, extra controls are given. So this is about how to, to handle the coverage. So the two aspects that I wanted to bring out in this, this discussion, the coverage discussion was that there are conscious efforts from design which are needed to make sure that the rest of the people who are down the chain in silicon validation, in the production test, they get enough control to test under special condition, to test the features that are supposed to be uh, either redundancy or sorts or margins. So they can test the margins and redundancies to make sure that the device has good uh, working area. So this is uh, the main idea. So coming to the next aspect of uh, coupling, which we had uh, discussed in the initial thing, because there are uh, digital and analog blocks, this becomes a key concern for, uh, um, for um, uh, this kind of a chip where mixed signal is handled. I can tell you from my recent, uh, um, recent work, which I've been doing, it's more in the, in the 5G uh, chip development. And we find that a lot of integration goes into these 5G receivers. And uh, you will find that uh, uh, many times the issues are just not about the ADC performance or DAC performance or even the signal chain performance. It's many times just about coupling. That there is some part of the, comp some part of, uh, the chip is coupling to the other part and then it impairs the whole performance. 
So coupling becomes way, way important than it was earlier. Now, in any complicated board, this needs to be taken care. And the issue with the coupling is that it cannot be very easily simulated because uh, you have to create the exact same conditions to make sure that the layout or the simulation tool catches it. And it needs a good amount of layout expertise. Uh, the layout expertise both at times of uh, silicon design, which is the chip design. So you have to make sure that sensitive elements of your design are not very, very close to the more noisy elements, um, which are the digital and some other kind of uh, analog plus digital blocks. And also during the test board design. So as a test engineer or a validation engineer, when I have to test the part, I need to make sure that the, the board or the PCB that I use that doesn't create uh, uh, proximity between uh, noisy and uh, silent elements. The same thing goes for customer cases when the customer or somebody uh, who is using your chip, they have to design a board. They also might find issues which are just because of the poor uh, placing placement of uh, uh, the pins on the chip. So the, the coupling is a, is a very, very relevant topic and something that uh, uh, you have to see to feel it sometimes. You have to do more tests uh, when you're doing in lab. You can actually see things interfering. The interference is nothing but the coupling. But then uh, digital to analog coupling is just a classic uh, part of coupling, which uh, is uh, all which has always been there, but it has gained more importance and relevance now. And a good quality block level analog design can easily be ruined by digital coupling. Like you make the best PLL in the world and then finally you place it in the wrong place and you have all sorts of spurs which can be created, all sorts of coupling or interference which can be created by the uh, uh, surrounding blocks. So, but, but debugging these coupling issues needs a good understanding of electric and magnetic fields. Uh, the same thing that becomes very useful in the form of an antenna can become very, very uh, problematic in terms of a mixed signal chip where you don't want random antennas coming just because you did not do the layout properly. So these debugs are, uh, they are interesting also once you solve it. Uh, before solving, they are definitely a challenge. So uh, I will uh, maybe touch upon uh, one of the uh, uh, cases that we had solved uh, in like this was maybe three, four years back, but uh, still maybe interesting to share here. But a good understanding of the system application. So the last point is uh, a little different from what uh, I have mentioned so, so far. Now, even though the board can limit uh, the amount of performance you get, if you have a good understanding of the system application, sometime there is uh, a solution from system level. And uh, this might just look like a statement right now, but uh, uh, one of the things I will touch upon is this. So you can use the chip in a different way or time your uh, uh, usage in such a way that they don't uh, talk to each other. It is like you give some time for the noisy kids to talk and then uh, teach the other person during that time. So it's like time multiplexing, for example, something like that. So you can do something uh, uh, based on the knowledge of the system application which can help to reduce these couplings. This is a case study on an optical time domain reflectometer. This is something which uh, I think uh, some of you might be aware of who are uh, having a course on optical communication, that you have uh, an optical fiber and uh, it's used for uh, transferring a lot of information. It's like all the internet that we use today is primarily back-ended by this. But then in this uh, uh, use case, uh, the issue comes when there is a defect in that channel and the defect in the channel needs to be detected uh, because these are long cables and kilometers and hundreds of kilometers far long. You cannot really go and uh, find out where the cable broke, uh, which is similar to even electrical uh, power transmission. This similar problem exists. Uh, but then there are methods to uh, detect these by sending a known signal from one end of the fiber and uh, receiving the signal which comes from these defects. So whenever there's a defect in the in the path in any channel, uh, the nature of the defect is that it will reflect back some amount of energy. The energy which was supposed to pass through will come back. And by detecting the amount of energy you get back and knowing the speed of light in this context, uh, you can find out how far the detect defect lies. So the light takes uh, a very prescribed amount of time to go from this point, the starting point to the uh, defect uh, location and uh, once it comes back based on the intensity of it and uh, the time taken you can always uh, characterize it as i am showing here you can see a certain display which shows some light intensity received and sudden jump in the uh, intensity so the x-axis here is the time so you send some signal and after some time if you get an echo 
that echo is telling you the position of the defect. So this is the uh, use case. Now where uh, the uh, the um, chip uh, which we made lies is in the electronics which is shown here. So it's basically used for sending the different frames of light pulses that I mentioned for detecting. The reflected power is stored and averaged because uh, it's, a, it's a measurement and measurements are typically always done uh, with averaging so that the overall noise of the system is uh, reduced. And the resulting power trace is the loss profile of the fiber. So whatever trace you see here, there is always a constant light which you will get back. But then whenever there's a defect, you will get a lot more power. And that lot more power or intensity, you can see here, this trace shows, the moment the intensity increases, that tells you the location of the uh, uh, defect. This is the whole application. And uh, the kind of device that TI made for them was uh, uh, called an OTDR, EOTDR, it's an embedded OTDR. The, uh, the marked box here is the one which is uh, the full front end that uh, we had offered. And uh, these are the two components which are not a part of the chip, but these are laser diode and the uh, photo detector. These are the optical to electrical converters effectively, one for transmitting and one for receiving. <clears throat> but then as a component uh, or as a, as a system, right, you can see the same LNA, the filter, ADC, and then there's a logic, uh, uh, digital logic sitting here, which is used for averaging and uh, sending pulses. So you send the pulse, you get the pulse back, and then uh, do the calculation to compute the uh, uh, distance. But then the interesting thing is there's a RAM sitting here. In this particular issue that I was talking about, the RAM became the culprit. So what happened was uh, whenever there's a write to the memory and uh, this memory is like a 128K memory, but it has it has been broken into multiple small blocks. Usually the memory will not be always put at a single continuous block because of fabrication issues. They are put as small issue, small blocks. So we had multiple of them here and uh, the every memory was 8K words and uh, some 16 of them were existing. So from our capture, the, when we captured the data that was after the averaging, we found that there were some, so this entire plot that you can see here, this was supposed to be a flat noise spectrum, nothing else. Now this kind of, the noise that you can see per sample here, you can see the, the red thing, right? It's basically the sample, sample received. So there was supposed to be some noise, but we found that uh, the noise had a pattern where there were some jumps specifically at certain points. And those were unexpected. Eventually, we found that it was mapping to the memory uh, pattern, the, the the width of the memory or the depth of the memory. Because we have an 8K word memory, it was showing some kind of a pattern here. Now, going back to what it is caused of, again, uh, we did a lot of analysis, a few months of work, and then finally, a uh, few things emerged. We basically looked at how the memory has been laid out. And this is important for any coupling debug. You have to basically open up the design to an extent that you can understand the aggressor and the victim. Who is generating the disturbance and who is catching the disturbance is the very key component in whole that. And sometimes it might mean that you have to cross across uh, compartments. You have to cross across the, the boundaries of design, validation, and uh, layout. And so you have to try to understand many more things than just the testing. So in that aspect, we went and looked at how the actual memory layout in the chip was how the chip was organized. So this chip had the analog and the digital. You can see here, these are wires. This is a picture of the chip uh, cut out. And there are, uh, these are the wires, the wire bonds. These are the pins on the top. The numbering that you can see, 1 to 48, these are the actual physical pins outside. But the chip is, uh, the silicon chip is sitting inside here. And there were two different chips. One was a digital chip and one was an analog chip and they were connected through wires. But then what we found was uh, the memory which is sitting here on the lower side, that used to impact uh, the input, which is so much far away. So just the proximity was so high so far, but still there was uh, so much coupling and uh, an impact whenever the memory comes into action. That's why uh, because of the distance, we ruled out the electrical coupling because for electrical coupling, typically you need a parasitic capacitor or something, but then magnetic coupling was possible. So to rule out the magnetic coupling, uh, we did onboard experiments. So this is the next step of it where after having understood what are the possible victims and aggressor, what could be the possible cause, we may have to do experiments on the PCB to try to isolate them. 
so we found that there are the input traces or the inputs to the to the to the chip the analog section was open and we tried using uh, shielding the uh, input traces so once we did that it it improved quite a lot so this gave us gave us an idea that uh, it was more or less magnetic now once we catch this we have to come up with an idea to uh, fix it and uh, this is one of the fixes which is the bury trace idea so whatever traces i showed you in the previous slide open this is on the top of the pcb that you can physically see and then if you want uh, to shield them you basically need some ground plane and uh, just like uh, shown in this example what we did was we asked uh, uh, the customer to put shielded trace or the, the 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 signal was actually put inside the pcb this is a multi layer pcb so instead of routing the signal on the top which can have much more magnetic influence if you put it inside the pcb you have ground layers on top and bottom which can shield them so because the multi layer pcbs are just like norm all all the electronic uh, boards will have multi layer pcbs because of the complexity of chips this kind of a design is still possible so this was uh, one of the the ways you could actually you understand the magnetic uh, coupling and then you can come up with uh, a solution which can be just a pcb revision uh, which is still acceptable sometimes you have to go further next level up and fix the design but that was not done in this case then the same issue was solved by another method which is a system solution as i mentioned earlier that there are system solutions possible for these kind of issues and uh, as an analogy when i was telling about the time multiplexing thing here we used a, a similar kind of a thing where uh, we we changed the phase of the clock so the system clock which makes the memory toggle or the memory disturbance we just shift the position of that activity so it is like saying that whenever my analog is trying to check the input i will not do digital activity there so by doing some of those things we could uh, do get some more uh, improvement and i am not enough time to <laughs> touch upon this but i can show you the results which we had got so you have the original on the left top then the right top is the one which was only the board shielding related ex experiment and then we had uh, the system solution where we can actually move the uh, the mag the digital activity itself uh, up and down and get some advantage so this is the mag the coupling related uh, uh, data that or the information that i wanted to share you where you basically no need to go a bit beyond uh, uh, just the information that is provided you have to go into how the device is packaged how it might be laid out or how you might be testing even so all those things let's say a board uh, issue can uh, uh, sometimes uh, make this coupling much more than what the chip is doing by itself so the coupling uh, is one of those aspect that needs a little more inter inter uh, um, meaning inter uh, team skill you have to just kind of go across the domains and look for it okay so this is the uh, the last section um, of the, the 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 talk where uh, i'll be talking about uh, the device calibrations and tuning uh, because as i mentioned that you have uh, digital algorithms also designed for uh, so because you have digital and analog you can use digital uh, intelligence to to convert or uh, to to correct your analog so you have analog uh, impairments mainly because uh, you cannot make the best transistor in the same technology always you cannot have everything matched uh, across process you cannot have something which is completely voltage independent so there are many many variations which make the analog very sensitive and the performance cannot be guaranteed across these parameters but then because uh, we have a digital section sitting in and the digital is good in data crunching and uh, algorithms so you can use digital algorithms to correct the analog or at least estimate the errors so this is the example of that kind of a thing where you have a designed uh, uh, block meant for uh, calibration or tuning your analog so the context i am taking is the pipeline adc which i have been working on mostly uh, i mean the initial years so a pipeline adc as a fundamental understanding is a uses a principle of divide and resolve where an input has to be resolved into digital but you use multiple stages to resolve it every stage has a, a small architecture like this where you use a, a coarse estimator and uh, then uh, subtract that estimated value from the incoming input but to understand it much more easy way which is uh, much more understandable for all of us as we have uh, done our 
primaries, you can think of uh, dividing a number into some levels. So it is like you are given an input of 55. You basically want to understand uh, uh, how many times 16 is present. So it is like estimating by stage one. Like you are going step by step, finer and finer. And uh, at every point of time, you will get something called a residue. And you will get an actual output. So this output is going to be processed. And you know there are three steps of 16 present here in 55. Then there is a single step of uh, four, which is present. It is also similar to whatever you do for converting a decimal to a binary, almost similar. So this is the analogy. You do it in steps. That's the main idea of a pipeline ADC. But when you are doing it in a step, the issue is that that every step that you are doing, uh, every stage, uh, it uses some analog elements. In this case, it's called a DAC element. Uh, and they can create uh, some kind of error. Although it needs a little bit of more detail to understand uh, the nature of the error. Maybe somebody who is uh, who's having a pipeline or ADC background might be able to understand better. But I'll just skim through this material so that it doesn't uh, uh, hold you down. I would rather suggest that all of you can uh, just take it from the top level and not try to uh, very specifically look into the details at the moment, because maybe we don't have time that much. So uh, there's a static mismatch. So let's say, if, suppose you take it. Um, from me that there are some elements that I'm going to use here. And then if suppose these elements were supposed to be equal elements, but then during fabrication, they don't come as equal, you might see an error. That is the simplest way I can put it to. If suppose this CS by four was not exactly CS by four, but had some error compared to this one, as all of them were supposed to CS by four, any mismatch is something which can deteriorate the performance of this chain. And uh, that is one thing that we would like to uh, estimate. So mismatches in these capacitors can cause uh, non-ideality in the ADC. And uh, these are some specific examples for uh, a pipeline ADC. But uh, as a much more uh, relatable thing, if suppose I give you a ramp and there was no error in the ramp, the output pattern will look like this. And the ramp is just like a um, sweep from into one end to the other end. If I give you an input uh, and apply into NEDC where there's a mismatch in those capacitors that I showed you earlier, you might see some issues at these points like this. So you are not able to reconstruct what was given to you. And ADC's work is basically to reconstruct exact data in digital. So if you have errors like these, that ADC will be termed as uh, poor performing ADC based on how much this error is. So there is a DFT or the design for testing, which was added here. This is to estimate the cap mismatch. So basically, whatever we have seen there as different caps, there was some algorithm put to uh, connect those caps one by one in a sequence. So it uses some inbuilt engine to force a DAC or force connect a cap and measure the uh, contribution of that cap. So it's effectively, you can think in a very abstract level, you are trying to measure the cap. If the cap is not CS by four and it is away, then you will basically put a correction in the digital. You will ask the digital to compensate for it as simple as you're not going to change the cap but you are going to do some correction in the digital because the adc will give a digital output and you can process anything on top of it so you can always correct it for the errors so that's the whole idea of calibration where you basically try to estimate these elements and put appropriate calibrations in the digital to take care of the impairment and that improves the performance, that improves the production yield, which means the uh, failing parts will become lesser and lesser. Right, so with this, I think uh, uh, I'm, I've reached uh, the concluding remarks. But uh, uh, whatever I have been insisting or, or telling for this, this long time was uh, uh, is summarized here, where I was, uh, it's about uh, finding the difference from the digital only chip and the analog only chip validation is very different, mainly because so much integration is going in. It's very relevant that we understand the mix signal because you might face, come across more and more uh, um, uh, examples of mix signal chips to be used in your, in your applications case. It requires some understanding of analog and digital design also, because when you, un when you test something, you need to understand the design. So your spectrum has to become wider. You have to find architecture specific details to enhance the coverage. 
you have to come up with DFT blocks to improve observability. As I have shown you examples, how you can improve the observation of those uh, blocks that I showed you. But there are many types of blocks. Architecture-wise, you have to look at all of those and improve the observability. And the board and PCB understanding to solve the coupling issues is uh, the next level where you have to see how the usage can sometimes limit the performance. So those things have to be also taken care of. So this is, uh, this is all about uh, uh, what we have covered so far. And uh, uh, we can do two things possibly, uh, either take questions on this right now, or I have one final slide which uh, I had put together for sharing with uh, all the aspirants to just understand uh, the kind of uh, skills or the technical skills that uh, the industry looks for. So we can take either way. Uh, Mani sir, Priti ma'am, can yeah. you suggest? Sure, uh, uh, Pradeep, you can continue with this one. Okay. Just explain okay. how the students can involve in the industry. Okay, okay. Okay, so I'll go to the last slide, which uh, I had specifically missed. Uh, I, I felt that many of the students look forward to it. Uh, when I meet them during interviews or uh, during any other interactions, I think the one question is what to study. And uh, this is something that Again, only from my experience, obviously, this is not exhaustive and it's not all. You can always uh, learn more. But uh, if you look at the start, the first thing that I would suggest all of you to be very good at is the network analysis. It is the backbone of uh, uh, electronic circuits. So about circuits, you need to know the basics of analysis, how to analyze the system, because unless you know analysis, you don't know synthesis. You can't make uh, new circuits out of it. So analysis is very, very important. And very basic network uh, theorems like these, I, I have seen uh, many times during interaction with many other college students and all. They Sometimes uh, they may know by this, these things by name, but they don't know how to use it to advantage, how to simplify a circuit using these uh, simplification theorems. Then the switch circuits and a very good understanding of how the DC and AC sources work. and. So the network analysis as a whole is a very important subject, which I would insist that all of you who are aspirants uh, to work in circuits or uh, um, in system design even. In fact, system design also needs it very well. And uh, uh, this comes very handy. Then the basic OPAM fundamentals are again critical because OPAM is one of the most uh, mostly used uh, analog element in uh, any design. So the OPAM uh, by itself becomes so important that you must uh, know well about it. That the MOS-based circuit designs are, are good to know, but not a must. Again, that is more like uh, uh, the MOS-based designs typically keeps changing, and there's a lot of innovation keeps on happening on the specific device, the, uh, the technology that is under use. There are many features which might change, some non-idealities might come. So you, you must know. It's, it's good to know, but not a must to know. Uh, it's always an advantage if you know, but again, there is a uh, uh, a limit. If you can model that uh, MOS element uh, in terms of an already known network element, uh, you are good. So that is the way you should look at a MOS that uh, it is what it is finally going to do. So uh, not the very detailed level unless you are planning for a device physics. That position is different and obviously that, that needs uh, it as a must for a device physics uh, work. Then the digital design basics where your understanding of setup whole time for sequential circuits is again a must. These are simple things, uh, and uh, understood in a simple way, uh, they would uh, be very, very handy and necessary also. Uh, because if you need to deal with mixed signal things, that you need to know how the digital design works. And uh, obviously not to the depth of a designer, but then at least to the depth of understanding it. Uh, with time, it always improves. Then the signal processing is, again, uh, something that uh, uh, is very, very relevant today, because a lot of work happens uh, uh, with the signal processing. Like everything is signal processing today uh, because the times where the signal processing blocks would sit separately as a DSP <clears throat> have now slowly faded. Now more of it is coming on the same chip. So people want all those signal processing blocks in the same chip and uh, technology allows it. It has already reached a node where you can always put all those this thing elements together. But then uh, when you are handling them, you must know some very basic concepts and uh, these con the concepts are like all time needed because once you convert anything into digital, you must understand these basic concepts of how the aliasing happens and how the sampling is there. And then the the digital or the uh, the uh, digital domain or the sample domain understanding of uh, a signal is a very very uh, useful thing, which comes handy. And uh, 
after that the analog and digital filters are again good but not a must uh, because these are like uh, some things which you can always develop with time you have tools in matlab you have tools uh, in uh, anal I mean, different tools which can help you to design these filters just by giving a specification the problem is that if you don't understand the basics of filters you might still uh, find a non optimum solution so that's why it is a good to have but not must to have but on a whole the the understanding of network and uh, opam for analog and digital for uh, uh, the digital design for digital these will be the the key things that i must highlight along with signal processing obviously because of uh, the kind of uh, movement in industry everything is uh, about signal processing so this put together i think suits precisely what uh, the ec is all about electronics and communication i think covers these things together uh, all we need to do is to specifically focus on those specific subjects courses make them much more uh, i mean close to you understand it well and then present yourself to uh, to to any any of these uh, uh, industry things and that i think uh, will will definitely be a great thing and uh, i i hope that many of you would uh, uh, go back and and maybe work on this and get it much better and then this is again a good to have but not a must the effect of layout and all this can still come with more experience so it's not a necessary thing at the college level but uh, it's good to have if you can understand it that's all uh, in the in the presentation that i had uh, and i think uh, we can have a q and a session thank you so much sir for the wonderful lecture it was very informative session uh, i can say that our participants are definitely benefited from the lecture and uh, now i would like to invite uh, professor manish panchal sir for the q and a session manish sir thank you so much pradeep uh, for very informative session that uh, you have shared very practical knowledge with us there are total 5 to 6 question for the from the participants the first question is that which tool is best to design and test analog and mixed signal circuit yeah so uh, from uh, what i have seen in industry there is uh, uh, practically no single tool which can give you all these uh, thing together okay uh, because uh, many times uh, the adcs and any digital uh, blocks are very very complex to put into a simulation tool Okay. the analog pure analog can be tested easily with so many spice things spice tools and uh, but there are some specific tools which are like uh, uh, from agilent there is an uh, advanced design systems which is used for uh, uh, simulations of analog plus digital to some extent but still you won't find an adc there as such what you can still find is a model of adc that you can put so you can do still some functional simulation at the system level Uh, where you can say that this is the behavior model for my adc and this is my analog uh, so you can still do some bit of it but uh, a single easy tool is uh, not present for doing the full testing of a mixed signal design okay and the second question is uh, suggest open source uh, software for designing the cmos circuits any open, open source software for that Uh, i at least remember something from my uh, uh, my time in my masters uh, there used to be one uh, lt spice by linear technologies but mm -hmm. that is only one one of them uh, there may be more but you can search for it lt spice is something which was available then and uh, uh, it and there are many more tools which can allow you to uh, include the models uh, because for all the mos simulations it is important to uh, refer to the right model if you don't have the correct model file all your simulations can be completely wrong so you have to be very careful about on uh, on uh, including the model so whichever tool like lt spice is just one example which was open source and we were asked to use that but it is like 10 years back so there might be more tools which have come now and being in industry it's like uh, we we get the more licensed tools now uh, okay. but then for the students uh, uh, this is one way you can search you might find it easily but the catch is that you have to be careful about the places where you download the model from there's a model file which many universities put like berkeley has their own which we used to use then so you have to uh, uh, be careful and uh, aware about the model that you use for the mos that is important that okay. you can keep free still okay uh, the third question is again from the student side that which language should be used to learn uh, vsdl or verilog 
okay, you are want to get any chance in industry okay okay typically in industry people uh, uh, prefer verilog uh, because of the ease with which uh, it is uh, it is usable but vhdl vhdl is more like a, a standard uh, or it's like more stringent uh, language so uh, usually uh, at least in the design uh, areas you will find that people use it interchangeably there are tools which will understand both of them there is no specific uh, preference given as such let's say for example you know any one of them but you know the concept well because the language is just a way of coding it but then finally it is a hardware design if you know how the language translates to a la to the hardware that is what they will look for but one language any language is okay verilog is easier so if you set out to learn verilog you will find it easy vhdl will take a little bit of more work but uh, i would uh, suggest uh, learn the the hard thing first uh, you will like the easier thing anyway <laughs> so you will learn it easy fast yeah but one more, no one more uh, very practical question is that will fpga replace node mcu or raspberry pi in the future fpgas typically are um, very popular but the issue with the fpga is the cost so okay. many times uh, the choice is uh, a prototyping will take fpga but then mass production always goes with the uh, asics okay. so replacement is only possible to a level where uh, uh, it's a specialized product only for prototyping because fpgas are very fairly costly uh, because they are not uh, the yield is not so good so they may not replace but they will still coexist big companies never use fpga uh medium level companies like uh, the customers we deal with the big ones will never use uh, fpga and uh, the middle ones sometimes uh, only rely on fpga because their volumes are lesser okay one more question is that uh, pradeep uh, how the texas has uh, minimized this trade off between the speed and power consumption within a chip yeah so uh, typically uh, for uh, the speed uh, and the power trade off right the, the most uh, practical method is uh, pipelining as uh, so not pipeline parallelization sorry not pipeline parallelization so if you want to operate something at a very high, high rate you will still make parallel branches of it at least in our digitals which work uh, which are supposed to be lower power and we can't uh, the digital design designers basically make a four to eight way parallelization and then by doing a, a proper load sharing they get the optimum power so digital designs typically have almost gone to parallelization mode where you would not want to operate something at 2 gigahertz or 3 gigahertz because you can't uh, close the timing for the design so in fact practically making a big design at that rate is not possible also because uh, your timing closures become very very tight okay so they usually bring it down by a factor of 4 or a factor of 8 uh, one more question uh, you had talked about the some mechanical coupling inside the ic is it feasible uh, no it's not mechanical it was uh, uh, magnetic oh yeah magnetic coupling yeah yes 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 so the magnetic uh, coupling is uh, possible because uh, sometimes uh, uh, having a magnetically uh, uh, what do you say magnetic shield package is uh, costly very costly okay. so many of these will be simple epoxy uh, covers and they will not have magnetic shield so they can still easily couple but those levels of coupling becomes important in only the very accurate Uh, applications like this particular application which i touched upon was a test and measurement application measurement application where they do the averaging for a long time so they actually keep on uh, looking at systematic patterns because of this averaging so even a small amount of noise will show up yeah so even though it was less it was limiting their uh, uh, performance and the last question is that uh, how much accuracy that you are getting in texas Uh, for converting any signal from analog to digital and digital to analog um, yeah so uh, analog to digital wise uh, uh, when we talk about the resolution the adc resolution and the dac resolution typically it also comes along with the speed parameter like okay. for example if you go to a very high speed source speed into resolution is a constant kind of a thing when you go to very very high speeds resolution enemy comes down and when you go to very low speeds the resolution can go up so uh, usually i i have not uh, directly worked on uh, high resolution parts but i can at least uh, tell you that uh, ti might have parts uh, of some 20 bit resolution 22 okay. bit resolution also i think 20 bit is what i have heard of maybe something might be in pipeline for the high resolution whereas for the high speeds where i usually work um, uh, the adcs which we work on is like 3 gigahertz adcs 
and uh, the resolution typically is like 14 bit and uh, for that speed uh, 14 bit is still a good number so depending on the use case uh, the higher speed goes to higher bandwidth application and lower speeds go to higher accuracy and lower speed operations control and industrial applications so then the accuracy can be attained at uh, lower speeds but not at very high speeds yeah and Pradeep, the last one is that uh, any book you, that you will suggest for uh, the students for the mixed signal? Uh, for the mixed signal, uh, I have not found anything which is well compiled. Uh, okay. It is mostly uh, different because the kind of material that I had shown you, you here is again uh, a little off from the regular uh, coursework because uh, these are more. Uh, uh, because testing and validation uh, rarely finds uh, a, a place because these are very uh, subjected to their own industries. I mean, different companies do different way. But okay. as far as the, uh, uh, like for example, coupling and all, you might find some uh, uh, notes from different people, papers on it, but not a single compilation of all the effects because uh, it's it's uh, not systematically well studied or uh, put together. Okay, Pradeep. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, uh, I request Professor Vivare, sir, to please uh, say a few words. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ashwin? Uh, yes, sir. You are audible. Please, audible. please go okay. ahead, sir. So, at the outset, uh, I mean, everybody is from family. Pradeep is also from the family, GSTF family. But, um, but he's the youngest one in the family. So I must say in one word, if I have to say, Pradeep, we are very proud of you uh, that you have been a student of electronics and telecommunication engineering department. Uh, right from the second year, I remember Pradeep used to walk in and say, Wo desh ke liye kuch karna chahta hai. I mean, he wanted to do something for the country. And uh, it was very obvious that what he wants to do is something as an engineer, electronics engineer, something into the production. So these words come much later on, Atma Nirbhar Bharat aaj a raha hai. But Prabhit right into 2003 or 4 was thinking what I can do for the country. I, I remember he used to come and ask some abstract question. And the only thing I could tell at that time is ki, jo abhi kar rahe ho, achche se karo. And um, he has stood to that thing and we knew that he probably will go to IIC or if not IIC then IIT. But he sort of made us happy that he went to CDT. And many of is a legacy. I mean, we are happy that GSTI has a legacy in CDT and Pradeep Nair kept to it. Even in those days, he used to do very good homework. I mean, he will always come with a homework. He will take a challenge. He will finish the challenge with sincerity. So even today, when I was looking at his slides, I mean, it's not only Pradeep for to tell you ki aap samne khade ho karke. of many webinar slides that I have seen, you are among one of the best ones. Matlab jo, we keep on telling people keep black mail likho, white mail mat likho, jada color mat vapro, distract mat karo, flow thik se rakho, shiru se akrite ka flow diagram pele vata. And you, so you took it to that. And uh, therefore, we are very proud that uh, you you are sort of representing Indore and GSTI into Texas Instrument. Um, I shall now shortly compile about what he said, of course, in a very philosophical sense. He works in a company which uh, John Kilby and Robert Noyce uh, sort of can say invented ICs into the country. But I don't know whether he, he might have seen John Kilby. I, I, I doubt because he left in 1983, although he's established it. And TI is the first company in India who is essentially, who started making make in Bharat type of a thing. And um, very philosophically, he said essentially that cheap, making cheap is a very expensive affair. And there is a great amount of teamwork is required into the whole thing. And um, so it's a big chain, big chain of understanding everything. And um, of course, he focused mostly on to what till now I was knowing DFT, DFE, a discrete Fourier transform. Today, now somebody asked what is DFT, I just said design for testing. And this is something which uh, which is now at least for a few days, DFT would be essentially designed for testing. Fir se discrete Fourier transform aaja aega, but aaj ke din to he has made a great impact on it. He also started very philosophically in saying that digital and analog are essentially by nature different. Digital is noisy. It feeds on creating spices, but it has a lot of noise margin. So it doesn't it doesn't bother about noise, but in the process it creates noise. And then if the analog is sitting next to it, which is very sensitive to noise, this becomes a big challenge. Yeah, department efficient 
कोई आदमी धीरे धीरे करता है काम पर वो सेंसिटिव होता है उसको कुछ जरा सा बोलता इतना सा भी नहीं किया तो ही फील्स वेरी फ्यूरियस की अरे मेरे को टाइम तो दिया ही नहीं आपने करके एंड देन ही केप्ट ऑन टॉकिंग अबाउट राइट फ्लो फ्रॉम द स्पेसिफिकेशन अप टू फाइनल स्टेज quickly sort of saying divide into three phases the one before it the tapes out the tape comes out and there are many things into that but right at that place you have to do something uh, so that you have test points coming out of it then he talked about the phase 2 which is the first pap and then it comes out but as he said the life doesn't end abhi bharat mein aisa kehte ki aap marne ke baad mein aapka zinda rehta hai us after the cheap has been sold to the market you have to the people will still come and say how do i use it so you have to have application notes and you have to have post really support to the people for various types of application and um, he sort of took up the whole panoramic view first uh, like a bird view from the top abhi aajkal camera mein rehta hai wo upar se dikhate hain and then fir zoom karke niche tak laate hain goes up itna karte karte then he finally came to how the test pins has to come out and which test pin has to come out and there again he said i mean if you have digital analog together one is noisy and another is is very sensitive to the noise he says समय ही समय ही सोल्यूशन है सो गिव समाइम टाइम गिव समाइम स्पेस एंड फास्ट अगर वो नहीं होता है तो दैट मनीष फॉर स्टॉकिंग गिव सर्टन अमाउंट ऑफ लेयरिंग सो यू पुट सम मैग्नेटिक कपलिंग इन बिटवीन बिकॉज कॉस्ट इज अनदर इम्पोर्टेंट सो यू कैनॉट पुट ए पुट ए शीट मैग्नेटिक शील्ड एंड टू दैट एंड नॉट ओनली टू दैट ही एसेंशियल इवेंट टू द नोशन ऑफ रिटर्नस ही इवेंट टू द कवरेज इवेंट टू द कंट्रोल वॉट पीपल शुड हैव because at the end of the day people who use this do not understand how much of blood and sweat has gone into it kitna khoon pasina ikattha hua hai usme malum nahi par zara sa bhi nahi chalta hai to log bolte hain are kya hai ye kya banaya hua hai they don't understand how much depth in things into got into it and uh, he has been motivator for the students also in 2014 he came i mean this rarely happens and many say maybe kehta hu मैं मेरी इंस्टीट्यूशन को बहुत कम बार गया हूँ वापस जो होल्टर साइंस कॉलेज और स्कूल स्कूल में कभी कभी गया हूँ होल्टर कॉलेज भी गया हूँ बट ही कीप्स इन टच विद द कॉलेज वन थिंग गोइंग बैक टू द रूट्स एंड रिमेम्बरिंग द रूट्स बिकॉज द रूट्स एसेंशियली कीप फोरेशन टू दैट एंड सो ही हैज रीच टू ए वेरी हाई लेवल ऑफ वेयर एज दिस शिक्षा दीक्षा पढ़ा जाए द स्टूडेंट नोस मच मोर देन द टीचर एंड इन दैट सेंस वी फील वेरी फॉर्चुनेट दैट यू हैव इनलाइट अस ऑन वेराइटी ऑफ डायमेंशन इन टू इट एंड सो आई ऑल द बेस्ट फॉर यू into the future keep coming to gsti again and then uh, keep uh, contact through the emails and other things and um, uh, we are very proud that as I, again i shall to summarize we are very proud that what pradeep nair looked to be as a second year student has stood up to that not only that place but has gone much 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 ahead of it and has become far more systematic far more comprehensive and far more confident than those days and you have really worked to the country as you were used to say mere ko desh ke liye kuch karna hai as engineer kuch karna hai kuch hardware banana hai aur sabko dena hai not only you have done that you are keeping contact and this human factor is also commendable for you as I, as we say you have already reached to a much higher level of these things so pradeep congratulations once again thank you very much and we will be in touch on um, uh, on email and other things I'm sorry, I have overshot my time. मेरे को दो मिनट दिया थे मैंने चार मिनट बोल दिया. But it's a certain emotional effect uh, when when you see you onto the face. Okay, take care and stay safe and work hard. Okay, thank you, thank you, Shekhar Sharma sir, Anjana Jain madam, Priti Trivedi, Ashwin, Manish Panchal. Anjana Jain का camera off है क्या शायद? हाँ आपका चेहरा भी दिख रहा है मेरे को बाकी Shekhar Sharma sir का दिख रहा है. हाँ इधर का. Okay, over to Shekhar Sharma sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Pradeep, uh, I think uh, yeah. it is the high time to tell you the words of director. While our seminar started, actually, just after that, he phoned me up and he called for special invitation to you to college. So, because he is not present physically here, so on behalf of him, I invite you to the college now again yeah. and establish some relationship regarding the uh, Texas University program that you are already. um uh, allowing some colleges to be included in your university program so yes, what yes. can be thought for gsits to be included in that so for that he wants really uh, he has basically shown um, i just don't want to call you in the face of the public but a gm like you should be called again and again so as to have good relationship with the good things and at the same time to establish some big things in the college sure so sir, we look you. forward we look forward for uh, establishing these relationships in future also pradeep and i really thank you to take time and explain us all these
because we are the guys who are uh, separately studying something something in corner and we don't know how the things are uh, uh, integrated in a big manner that you have tried to show as a bird's view so that is really uh, encouraging all the students i would like to uh, appeal to all the students on behalf of you also that the points that you have made in your slide the last slide the books that are to be attended well the things which are to be attended well they are really to be done and i would also like to uh, invite your suggestions for uh, some of the references that we need to make at that time and also some of the typical questions um, that that you also try to teach uh, while you were there in the course here and uh, expected the answers from the students at that time so i would like that now again can you really be Uh, sending us some set of such uh, typical questions that we need to uh, we need the students to be prepared for so we would be very thankful to you pradeep if you share all these things to us thank you so much thank you so much for sharing time thank you sir thank you so much it's a pleasure uh, to be a part of this uh, activity because i think it gives uh, some way to uh, share and give back uh, and i think yes. special thanks to priti ma'am i think she was the one who contacted me once and manish sir also to get got in touch i think it was uh, uh, it made me feel special partly because uh, i was being uh, uh, thought of uh, by you all Don't and it's, uh, it's a great opportunity thank you again thank we, you, we, uh, we, i was having a talk with uh, manish panchal sir yesterday that uh, we could not have a second pradeep after you <laughs> <laughs> and of course before you also <laughs> more more different type of people i think Yes. Shikhar, I want to say, I think he should become teacher after after the retirement from Texas. He is also a very good teacher itself, nay? Right? Ah, uh, Pradeep, we, yes. we would suggest you lovingly that you please uh, uh, become a teacher after your all uh, accomplishments are over and endeavors are over in the companies and what you know, <laughs> corporate life. I, I personally enjoy uh, sharing and uh, uh, I mean telling my experience and in fact. It, must be because of the teachers i have seen i think not only in college in school and in college together i think that part of uh, it remains with me where i also feel like uh, becoming a part of it but again uh, yeah definitely at some point uh, i would try to get into that with more seriousness thank you thank you i still remember your whole group actually yes yes <laughs> intelligent yeah. and very dedicated really thank you ma'am thank you and uh, pradeep has done the project under my guidance and i can remember ki wo dhoop mein khada reh ke bhi us solar trekking ka project karta tha aur bolta tha sir main reading leke aaya hu aap check kar le main iske pasina dekh ke mujhe samajh aata tha ki ye kitna mehnati hai matlab chhat mein itni der kadi dhoop mein khade rahe the thank you pradeep you will never find your, your type of students It's very difficult to find your type of students. I, I, I always give your example in each and every semester of my class. Exactly. <laughs> yes, Ashwin, please proceed. Yeah. So I would like to thank all the professors of our department for their motivational words. Now I would like to invite Professor Manish Panchal sir for the vote to for vote of thanks. Manish sir, please. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, I'm Manish Panchal on the behalf of Department of Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering, and as a coordinator of this webinar, convey the deep regards and heartfelt thanks to the director of our institute, Professor Rakesh Saxena, for gracing the function, and head of, of the department, Professor Shekhar Sharma sir, and all the senior faculties of members of the department. Uh, especially bhavare sir for providing the motivational support to organize this uh, webinar and uh, special thanks to mr pradeep nayar of course our students that uh, for accepting this invitation and uh, very sincerely giving this presentation and i can remember that he is he was the icon in the students and still i hope that you are still icon in the texas instrumentation also and uh, thanks to all the participants for giving the huge response and patiently listening the webinar hope you will be the part of the next webinar that will be organized by our department of electronics and telecommunications thanks to my colleague coordinator uh, professor priti tivedi madam thanks to my organizing committee professor ashwin and professor neeraj and remaining uh, remaining faculty members of the department so once again thank you so much uh, all the faculty members and special thanks to uh, pradeep 
थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू मनीष सर नाउ देर इज अनाउंसमेंट फॉर पार्टिसिपेंट्स वी विल पोस्ट द फीडबैक लिंक इन द व्हाट्सएप ग्रुप द टू व्हाट्सएप ग्रुप विच वी हैव क्रिएटेड सो यू कैन फिल द फीडबैक फॉर्म एंड द सर्टिफिकेट्स विल बी मेल्ड टू यू इन थ्री टू फोर डेज थैंक यू ओके सो विद दिस वी एंड अवर टूडे टूडे सेशन थैंक यू एवरी वन थैंक यू सो मच ओके कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन मनीष अश्विन प्रीति बाय Thank, Bye, you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Chalo, I'm closing. Okay, thank you.